I'm going to introduce myself very quickly before I start. Um, basically, you probably don't know my name, but many of you have run my code. Um, I'm the one who implemented most of the convolutions that you're running to train deep neural networks using NVIDIA GPUs. I also led the team that developed all the matrix matrix multiplication codes. So it's very likely that once in your life, you've cursed me because your deep neural network was not training and you were sure it was a bug on my side. Um, now I'm doing other things. I'm actually leading a team within the architecture group that is thinking about what our GPUs will look like in the future and how we want to make them as fast as possible such that uh, we can increase the, the compute power that is available to you to train your deep neural networks and extend the scope of all the cool techniques that we could see today and, and, uh, and solve all those very interesting problems. Uh, but to make it happen, you'll see that we have a lot of issues to deal with. And it's not only a question of silicon, it's not only a question of going to um, smaller processes and all those kinds of physical problems. It's also a question of software optimization and the fact that some of our deep neural networks are not very well suited for existing architecture. And I'm going to try to give you some ideas. Obviously, I would need way more time to go into the details, but I'll try to give you some simple ideas. So very quickly, um, if you're familiar with high performance computing, you know Amdahl's law. Uh, but if you're doing machine learning and you're not so much thinking about uh, the platform that you use to train your networks, it might not be the tool that you use every day. And the idea behind Amdahl's law is very simple. So just give me two minutes to explain that to you. Basically, on these diagrams that I'm showing you, uh, on the left, I'm showing you applications. And these applications have sequential portions and parallel portions. Sequential means the code is very sequential, step after step. And parallel is a code that can be run on parallel. And imagine now that you have an infinite number of processes such that you can make the parallel sections as fast as possible. If your original application has only 10% of parallel sections, the best gain you can get is only 1.1x. If it's 50-50, 50% sequential and 50% parallel, the best you can get is 2x. And if it's 90% parallel and 10% sequential, then you can go up to 10x. Why am I talking about that? Basically, the reason why I'm really emphasizing that point is that when you consider deep neural networks, there are potentially a lot of parallel sections or a lot of compute limited sections. I'm going to talk about compute limited sections uh, in a couple of slides. But this is fundamental that your applications are as parallel as possible or this is fundamental that your applications are as compute limited as possible because these are the parts that we can optimize. So if you start from the application on the left, even if you make magic parallel processors, there's about nothing you can do to speed up your application. And that's something you can do about. Um, typically, uh, we were talking about the transformers during the day. And these transformers are these um, deep neural network for uh, translation. And we were saying that transformers are better than LSTMs in terms of compute intensity and also from the fact that they can more easily be parallelized. So the architecture of the networks you design from architecture in terms of deep neural networks is very important to uh, allow us to give you better performance. A second problem that I want to talk about, it's also something very familiar to the people in the high performance computing industry, it's the critical path of your application. It basically there, it's not a question so much about parallelism versus sequentialism. It's more identifying what is the critical path in your application, what is the, the path of operations that determine the speed of your application. 
Because, I mean, in, when I was talking about Amdahl's law and, and putting this to the extreme idea of making the parallel code as fast as possible, what if the parallel code happens behind the scene when something else sequential is happening, then you'll see no gain in your total runtime if you make this parallel part as fast as possible. So this notion of critical pass is also fundamental. And my diagram on the top shows you a critical pass composed of three tasks. The first one is purely sequential, the second one is parallel, and the third one is sequential. Even if I make the parallel task as fast as possible by designing super awesome architecture, I'll still be limited by the sequential part on the top. And I will have some more room to run stuff um, after the parallel section, but still I won't see a huge amount of performance improvements. That's also very important and very concrete when you train deep neural network. Um, a few weeks ago, I think we, we published uh, this blog post on training ResNet 50, and a typical pipeline when you train a deep neural network is composed of a step where you decode your input, in this case, images from the ImageNet data set, and then you do different kind of data augmentation, and you know that more better than I do. Um, and then you run these data augmented images inputs into your training um, net, uh, into your training step to train your deep neural network. And what we realized is that we, we, we optimized the training as much as we could by making it as fast as possible on our GPUs, but at the end of the day, we were not getting so much speed up because all the time was spent in the decode and data augmentation steps. So in terms of software engineering, it has nothing to do with the architecture at this point. The architecture, the hardware architecture, we had to optimize that part. And we ported that part to the GPU, developed a library for that, and so on and so forth. So we have work to do at the application level if we want to be able to take advantage of any super cool architecture that we could build. And this is an illustration. Maybe, because we're building architectures, we could imagine putting special hardware, dedicated hardware to help was the decode and data augmentation step. And if we find out great ideas in this area, we'll do it. But um, it's also important for you to consider that you have to give us the possibility to make your code faster. That's one thing. Now, a bit more about architecture. Don't worry, I'm not gonna talk about gates and silicon. I'm not gonna go to that level of detail, just Let's talk about this very simple view of a GPU architecture. A GPU architecture is really a bunch of what we call streaming multiprocessors. Maybe you've never heard of that. Let's say these are our cores, like our CPU cores. And these streaming multiprocessors, these cores, they do the computations, they're connected to a memory system. We have the DRM, this is where you store your data, and to make it slightly faster or much faster, and especially take advantage of the spatial and temporal locality of data, we have a cache between the germ and the multiprocessor. So this is our architecture, a bunch of multiprocessors, an L2 cache, a DRM. Of course, when you design such an architecture, there are two fundamental things that you should care about. How much compute you can get, from this architecture and how much memory bandwidth you can get um, from the memory system. And we always think about that and you'll see that um, these two fundamental metrics are very important when you think about the future of computing and how you want to architecture your deep neural network to take advantage of the future architectures. So today, if I take a Volta GPU, which is the um, almost the latest, or there's, there's a new architecture after Volta, but let's talk about Volta. Um, the compute power of Volta GPU is about 110 teraflops. Flop, a flop is a floating point operation, like a multiply addition. And the amount of memory bandwidth that we have on Volta is about one terabyte. And we compute uh, a ratio between these two values, the amount of flop that you can do per byte that you can read from the system. And on this particular case, the amount of 
flops over bandwidth is 110. And if your application needs more than 110 flops per byte, then you're going to be limited by the compute. And if your application needs less than that, you're going to be limited by the memory bandwidth. When, why am I talking about that? You'll see that it's very important when you consider um, future architectures because increasing the flops is easier than increasing the memory bandwidth. And we've done that dramatically over the past few years. Um, for this graph, I took um, the last six uh, Titan GPUs that we released over the, the years, so from 2013 to today. And during about five years, we didn't really change the ratio between flops and memory bandwidth until recently where we realized that deep learning was very, very sensitive to the amount of flops to this ratio and then having a much higher ratio, being able to do more flops per byte was critical for the performance of deep learning. And there we were able to increase the number of flops on our architecture significantly. We won't be able to do that all the time. It was really a lot of work to do it, but increasing the flops, trust me, is much easier than increasing the memory bandwidth. So this ratio is not gonna go down anytime soon. And why is that important to consider this? And why is that important to think about this when you consider future architecture, how we're gonna make future GPU faster? It's because your applications are not always limited by the amount of flops. Your application, when you have a deep neural network, often you add some layers in your deep neural network that are not gonna be limited by flops. And they're gonna be annoying to deal with, to be honest. Um, maybe you need them to train your deep neural network. Of course, we understand that. But they are a pain in the ass for us to make the overall performance much better. And typically, in the, on this example, we have the ResNet 50 network. And on ResNet 50, if you take one of those bottleneck module, you have a convolution, one by one convolution, followed by a batch norm, a ralu, and then a three by three convolution, batch norm, ralu, and again, a one by one convolution and a batch norm. And then you branch to, or you add the residual, and, and you, you do that again yet another uh, bottleneck block module. A few years ago, that network, uh, that block, was mostly limited by the flops because the convolutions are limited by the flops. And a few years ago, before Volta, we, we were at about 90% of the time spent in compute-limited layers, the convolutions. And the batch normalization of the value were only about 10%. Nowadays, because we have a much higher flops over bandwidth ratio, we are able to speed up the compute limited parts by a huge amount. The memory limited part is not speeding up by that much. We're still speeding it up a bit, but not that crazily. And now the ratio is completely different in this new, in the same architecture running on the Volta architecture. We are now 56% flop limited, and the rest is only compute, uh, memory bound limited. So now, if we want to increase the performance of your application by building a new GPU, we have to increase the compute power, but the memory bandwidth by the same amount or pretty much. And that's much more difficult, that's much more costly. The technology behind memory, um, memory technology is more expensive and more difficult to master. So there are things we could do. And obviously, we're working very hard to increase memory bandwidth and flops on our architecture. But there are also things we can do at the softer level before it even sees the GPU. And we can work on these different implementations. And this is actually the kind of technologies that is being developed within the frameworks like TensorFlow or PyTorch, and so on and so forth. All those memory limited um, layers, maybe we can fuse them together such that instead of 
reading data from memory, writing data back, reading data again, and writing them back. Maybe we can keep the data in the compute units, the SNs, and avoid reading and writing from the memory system. It makes our application much less sensitive to the memory bandwidth, and we can improve the performance this way. So before we try to solve a problem, let's kind of eliminate the problem. Before we try to build super crazy hardware to expose a ton of memory bandwidth, let's remove the need for more memory bandwidth, sorry. Um, of course, it's an oversimplification. If you're familiar with batch normalization, um, you know that it's not that easy. That's not, you have to compute the mean and variance, and you have to distribute the data, and so on and so forth. We're thinking of ways to make that easier and faster as well. Another thing that I want to mention that is going to be critical in the future is that to make faster architectures, we basically increase the number of multiprocessors. This is the best way to do it. If you take a CPU, the number of cores is increasing like crazy. If you take a GPU, the number of multiprocessors is increasing by a lot. And over time, we went from 14 a few years ago to now 80 multiprocessors, and that's not gonna stop. And that has an impact, because if you take deep neural networks, a lot of deep neural networks is about solving matrix-matrix multiplications. Even a convolution can be expressed as a matrix multiplication. And the way we solve matrix multiplication is by distributing the computation over the different multiprocessors, or if you're on CPU, over the multiple cores, or if you're on a TPU, over the different units of the systolic array. And we do that, we distribute the work, but distributing the work has a huge impact on the arithmetic intensity of your problem. If you do the math, the smaller each, uh, the smaller the matrix computed by each processor, <coughs> the smaller the arithmetic intensity is. So one of the biggest challenges that all of us have to, ch to solve in the industry is to be able to find ways to exploit the data locality of the computation and do that in an efficient way by dealing with the increasing amount of memory bandwidth that is required and still be able to grow up the amount of flops that we have to do. So this is a huge challenge. But if you make our life easier, you can make our life easier. You can, and, and if you make our life easier, you're gonna actually benefit from it. Um, you can try to reduce the amount of memory bandwidth that you have in your applications, in your architecture. The transformer is a good example for that. Transformer runs all the gems in PL, and that's much faster than running an LSTM where you have to do a gem, then yet another gem, and so on and so forth in a sequential way. So my message is really, we have to work all together to design much better, or much better, much more compute intensive architectures. At the same time, we're gonna design much faster um, GPUs or much faster uh, processors that are going to deal with the fact that we need uh, to be able to have uh, a huge amount of memory in the coming months or coming years, and we are working on it. So I tried to really summarize that very quickly in, in, in the, the limited amount of time I had. Uh, thank you very much for all, for all for your time. I know it was a long day, so uh, now take some rest. Thank you, Beer. Uh, thank you. Thank you.